Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to most of you around the bridge. Uh, this is Sundara. I'm from the Institute Cynical team uh, hosting the webinar. Uh, thanks again for joining in. Uh, just to kind of quickly uh, give you a context, uh, today's webinar would be based on the theme of password-free banking with biometrics. And uh, we have a couple of uh, esteemed panel members with us uh, who would be kind of bringing a lot of industry experience with them. Uh, and uh, just before I get started with their introduction, I'll just give you a quick uh, ground rules on some of the uh, things for this particular webinar. Uh, if you're active on Twitter and you'd like to kind of pass on messages based on this, please use the hashtags biometrics as well as passwordless. Similarly, uh, the whole session will be recorded as well as the slides will be shared with email. So if you want to cross-reference it, you can always do that. And uh, we have a chat window on the bottom left corner. So if at any point you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to just drop in a message and I'll be happy to post it on the forum and then get our experts to answer that. And without further ado, I'll just quickly go in and give a quick introduction on both our panelists. Uh, we have Gopal from uh, Infosys Clinical and Edgework. He is our principal product manager who works on the biometric offering. Uh, in the past, he has been associated with many financial services organizations and he's been managing various platforms and products on that particular front. He brings in a wealth of experience both on the business as well as on the functional side. And uh, we also have Dennis, who is the co-founder and CEO of OneGenie, as well as an expert on the mobile security and authentications with respect to payments. Uh, for the last few years, his focus has been on enabling mobile-based uh, transactions on the fintech, including categories such as uh, PSD2, biometrics, FIDO, as well as blockchain. And uh, without further ado, I'll just give you a quick context. But before I get into the context, I just want to draw a quick poll. Based on uh, today's uh, sessions, I'd like to understand, uh, before we get started, uh, is biometric authentication a priority for your bank? Could you uh, possibly uh, answer it on this poll with a yes or a no? OK, I see the answers are trickling in. OK, I think we have enough responses. So let me just quickly uh, show the uh, poll results. Uh, interesting. So uh, given the context, I think uh, an overwhelming majority feels that bi biometrics is a priority. We have close to 90% of them mentioning that it is a priority, and about 10% are still skeptical. Uh, we hope that maybe by the end of the webinar, the 10% can be straight to the other side. So keeping that in mind, uh, we will just quickly run you through the overall context of what will be covered in today's uh, session. Uh, in today's session, we would be talking to why biometrics in banking and what is the context. And uh, the second trend would obviously be in kind of understanding the trends around biometrics in banking as to who's doing what and what are the various game changers in today's world. And the third spotlight is obviously going to be in being, in being the fact that uh, we are a part of the fintech industry. What is it that we offer within the space? And how is it any different from the rest of the market? And uh, just before the last Q&A session, we would have a quick demo to just run you through uh, overview of some of this so that uh, you can have a quick glimpse at what we have in store. And uh, I would now pass the baton to Gopal, our expert from Edgework, who will be kind of talking through the next few slides. Yeah. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I hope you are able to hear me loud and clear. Uh, so I'll start off with where we are uh, currently in terms of uh, you know passwords, usage, and popularity. I think the fact that uh, you guys are attending this call uh, makes it very clear that you understand that passwords have become a pain. Uh, I've given just some numbers to indicate how big a pain it is to kind of, you know, color uh, your uh, judgment on that. Uh, so these are actually outcomes from online polls. Uh, a normal user has to kind of deal with uh, 26 different account credentials and the related passwords. Uh, so that is too many to remember. And uh, you know, as a result of that, 60% of users reveal that you know, they've reached a point where they can't remember all their passwords. So they kind of start relying on you know, other modes like you know, saving it in a post-it note or Excel or Word document, which actually makes it less secure. Okay. This is from a consumer perspective. Uh, from the business perspective, uh, from the business perspective, uh, they are getting hit from both sides. One is that they are actually spending a lot of uh, money on the support costs. Uh, so 30 to around 10 to 30 percent of support costs are actually uh, incurred on password support. 
at the same time they actually end up losing a lot of business because of uh, you know the friction password creates a survey on an e-com site uh, basically from a retail perspective revealed that 45% of people when faced with a forgot password scenario actually abandon the transaction so businesses are actually losing money because of uh, you know the friction that passwords create and if you look at the other side of it passwords are not secure as well anymore uh, so the last number there is very indicative 63% of data breaches uh, that were reported last year were because of uh, passwords you know they are related to either a weak password or a stolen password or use, use of default passwords or things like that so moving on uh, this is how uh, scott adams uh, looks at it in his dilbert strips i'm sure we can empathize uh, with these strips uh, the first one is basically about the various password policies some allow capital letters some mandate capital letters some allow all special characters some don't allow all special characters only some of them and stuff like that and you know people are completely crazy you know they get totally confused so they set up something when they are asked to set up just to complete the transaction but when they actually have to reuse it again you know they get into this password reset flow which is even more painful you know people are asked to kind of run through hoops to actually reset their password and to add to it you know passwords are actually resulting in you know data breaches and stuff like that so so though this is a comical take of it the point is that passwords are no more safe and you know they are causing a lot of friction in the authentication process uh, so given this background uh, i will hand it over to dennis to talk about how biometrics why we feel biometrics would be a solution for this Thanks, uh, Kapal. Yeah, uh, hearing what you all, all said, that we have a strong problem in the uh, password uh, arena. But um, we see now that um, biometrics can definitely help us in uh, improving the authentication part. Uh, from one part, for the uh, user experience, um, so helping uh, getting better convenience for the end user, but also from a security perspective. Uh, recent research from Forrester, for example, they spoke about you know, the old way of how people are authenticated or verified or in, in what we're using for two-factor authentication, uh, sending a one-time password, that's becoming less and less secure because of the, uh, I would say, the Android devices where a lot of hacks are being installed already. And uh, since the last couple of years that Apple and Samsung released their devices with fingerprint on the uh, device itself, there was some traction initially for the, I would say, standalone applications, but lately also in the banking and the finance industry. I will come back to that later on. Uh, fingerprint and voice is a little bit different. You see traction getting there, uh, mainly in the authentication process and for fraud prevention. So, looking at some trends I would like to share with you. Um, the global adoption of fingerprint on mobile devices, especially in the, in the financial services, banking and insurance, is really being adopted. Although there is different regulation worldwide, we see that, uh, for example, in Europe, people start to use the fingerprint. In Asia and some other countries, it's there. Uh, some countries still have a problem with regulators, so we have to deal with that. I can explain a little bit more uh, later on. But uh, research has shown that people who have an option for using their password or fingerprint, that more than 90% prefer their fingerprint. Next to fingerprint, we say facial and iris scan. Facial is more face recognition and iris scan. You need more advanced um, cameras on your device, but it's getting there. And, and the voice, which is another biometrics, is mainly being used in the call center. But having said that biometric takes off, the downside is that you need to implement more secure, I would say, user behavior authentication along with the biometrics to absolutely sure that the data is, your, your data, enterprise data, is being protected. So, and um, looking at that market, then the, the last trend is that for the last couple of years, we see the biometrics hardware providers who are uh, popping up. Uh, they were already there sometimes, or they provided governmental stuff and now moving into the mobile space. But we see also a lot of new software vendors, software vendors which are 
especially focused on mobile authentication, facial recognition on the mobile device itself. So those are the cool things. But if you would like to apply that in your own infrastructure, whether you have an app or not, uh, and you would like to include the biometrics on top of your current infrastructure, for example, uh, um, a username password you have already, then you need to do some extra things. So from one side, you need to protect the app itself. You need to make sure that the device is not being jailbreaked, uh, that the app is not being jailbreaked, and that the security communication between you and, the, and your organization is absolutely secure and hardened. That's why we, for example, use payload encryption and all kinds of behavior analysis at the backside to make sure that the data is not being abused and that the identity and the person behind the face recognition is not being uh, abused. Because you still need, as an enterprise, that's how we look at it and what we see now popping up in the market, is that as an enterprise, you have to deal with multiple authenticates. It's the face, it's the fingerprint, it's the PIN code. And you need to be in control. So you have to do a number of new things which you haven't done before. And if you apply that to the, uh, the processes, then the biometrics is can be applied in different arenas. So from one side, it can be uh, applied in the identification process, which makes a much more seamless onboarding process of your new customers in the Know Your Customer process. So for example, uh, identify, identify the person, immediately make a picture or make a face recognition, which you can leverage in a later stage when people log into the app itself. Uh, we see new services popping up there for the identification um, for the fast onboarding. Um, so you have the biometrics being used on the mobile device itself. And uh, we discussed before that we're using force, for example, for uh, identifying person in the call center. But you see a new trend also popping up is that the call center is using the mobile app also to identify the person. So just sending out an alert to the mobile phone of the user, he will identify himself with his eyes or face, and he is identified in the call center, which makes it very seamlessly uh, in order and, and fast and cost efficient. But having said that, there are a lot of things around security, because how do you absolutely know that the biometrics being used is secure. And we look at it as it is a kind of key. Basically, it's another key next to the PIN code or the password you already have. Um, we always advise people to use a PIN code at least next to the biometrics because biometrics can still fill when it's dark or even using, using the fingerprint when your hands are wet or whatever. Uh, it doesn't work. And you still need to access your app, of course. So you need to have fallbacks in place to control that. Um, so that's the reason I explained to be and implement extra security controls in your environment in order to get everything working. The other thing is that you have biometrics vendors which are a little bit different than the other. So from the outside, it's very difficult to to see which one is better and what's more applicable. And it also depends on the regulation uh, in your country. But uh, from one side, we, uh, we see vendors which are FIDO-based. Uh, FIDO is a new standard, I'll explain in a couple of slides, uh, which is based on encryption, private and public key. Other ones will scramble and do the authentication on the device itself and then send the result over to the server, to your enterprise. And some of them capture the voice or uh, on the device itself uh, and then sends it over. So in essence, they're all having the same objective, identify the user. But the way they do it is quite differently. So if you have server matching, then the server is doing the real calculation and matching. And the device is being used to capture data. So we see that a lot of in governmental devices on the airports where you capture your device or your fingerprint and then it's being uh, sent to the server. In the mobile space, you see that we use also the device to capture, for example, your face. Just take a, thing, uh, take a picture, send the picture out to the server, and the server will do the calculation and the matching on the server side. 
The counterpart is local matching. So everything is being done on the device itself. That's where, for example, the fingerprint, the fingerprint is typical of local matching. It's done on the device and only the result or something stored on the device you can use in your process later on. So, why do you think that, uh, just, just have a quick question uh, and, and a poll. Why do you think that the uh, biometric authentication is required for your bank? Because the uh, initial poll we saw that at least 90% are looking at biometrics and it's almost a requirement. But it's also interesting to see for what reason you would like to, uh, to apply biometrics. So, let me give you a couple of set, uh, seconds to question. Uh, yeah, one, one of the audience members has a question saying, uh, isn't regulation also making it a mandate? Because in some regions, there is a requirement where you would have to think about biometric as an alternative to the various security issues. So is regulatory mandate also one of the reasons for a biometric authentication being required by a bank? Uh, it can be. It's, 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 it's still... Uh, I would say uh, optional for most of the uh, for the countries, and it's more what we now see in in, in the regulation that they're still uh, a little bit hesitated whether they allow fingerprints or not. Uh, we see that, uh, for example, in India, it's allowed to store the fingerprint or the actual biometrics on the on the server side. In Europe, it's not allowed. So the, it definitely is very different from different angles, but. Uh, at the same time, we see that regulators are understand that biometrics can ha definitely help to make transactions more secure. So that will change in the near future. And it will be maybe, uh, I would say, more embedded in the regulation uh, and also in the, uh, in the payment directives which are applicable in, in Europe and, uh, and worldwide. So... Steady again, interesting results to see. So based on the results, I think interesting. So uh, again, what we see is that almost 85 percentage of the audience think that it's primarily towards the password-free experience. Uh, yeah. About 15 percent of them are still not sure as to why it's required. They would like to know more. And we have a very, very small section which thinks it would actually save costs. So I think as we delve further, we would have a different reaction, but I think I'll leave it up to you and go Gopal to kind of delve further on. And also, uh, one more quick question as we went through the poll was that uh, uh, this question was specifically from the Asian market. Uh, the question was uh, from Harish, and he was asking, uh, how do you handle Asian markets where all the requests are carried out by bearers? Like this bearer could be someone like your telephone operator, could be someone like your internet service provider. So you have multiple bearers at various touch points. So how do you ensure that the biometric or whatever authentication is secure enough and it's carried safely from the actual customer to the bank and back and forth? Um, that's interesting. I will address that one in the next slide, so I'll explain a little bit. Is that okay? So um, looking at the results, interesting that most of the users use it for password-free uh, consumer experience which is quite important, then the cost saving is, an, uh, is a very small percentage. Um, these two are related in a sense. So from one side, it's absolutely, you know, when you have convenience, people will definitely use your service model more and more. But at the other hand, we see that there are use cases, a lot of use cases where convenience and ease of use will definitely help in cost savings, password resets, uh, the ease of you to get access to data, uh, like I explained in the call centers where you can leverage the mobile device and the authentication uh, in, so you can save time in the, in, in, uh, in the call you're doing. So eventually the main driver is passwordless free, but we see that there's a, a cost saving related to that. So, and then, and then I will answer the question is, uh, regarding different touch points and, and biometrics. Um, Going back where you have the local and server matching, um, most of the traditional biometrics is being used on, I would say, in governmental border control kind of solutions, where people give their fingerprint on a hardware device, it will be stored somewhere centrally, and it can be reused from different endpoints. So the actual biometric is stored somewhere, 
which can be reused and matched again, uh, whether there is encryption between or not. So uh, that's the, I would say, the traditional one, which is a little bit different from uh, difficult from regulators because you have to uh, make sure that the data is really protected and that cannot be reused uh, anywhere. Uh, if you look at mobile authentication and mobile biometrics, it's a little bit different. Uh, for example, having the fingerprints on the device itself, it gives you actually via biometric mechanism access to some secure data that's stored on the device itself. The result can be stored on a central server. So the actual fingerprint, the actual biometric is not being stored. And it's not, it can also not be copied to another device. So whenever you enroll your fingerprint in a mobile app on a different device, you get access to the key, but you cannot reuse the already enrolled fingerprint which was on a different device. So every device has to enroll the fingerprint. So when you have different touch points, different endpoints from a consumer perspective, and you're not going to store one central biometrics because of regulation or whatever, then every time the user has to enroll his fingerprint, his authenticator on the device itself, which cannot be reused. So there were a lot of standard uh, standardization. If you look at the hardware and the software, there was a lot of uh, discussion about uh, uh, standardization because all the hardware authenticators could not be reused across systems. So that's where FIDO, FIDO Alliance, uh, popped in. Uh, in, uh, in 2012, the uh, consortium of the larger enterprises, such as Google, Microsoft, uh, RSA, et cetera, and Samsung, they uh, were the founding partners and started an alliance to to have a more standard around how people can, or how authenticators should communicate in a secure way. And that's starting to take off. You see a lot of implementation right now. For example, on Samsung Pay, but also Bank of America, as an example, is using FIDO-based uh, fingerprint in its mobile app. It's, it's based on uh, more private, public and private key. It's crypto. Uh, there's a lot of standardization about that. Uh, so whenever you have a FIDO-compliant authenticator, you can plug it into your system. So it makes it much more flexible. Keep in mind that it's not about the quality of the biometric itself. It's about the standard. It's about that these two devices can communicate. It doesn't say about how good the biometric itself is. So you always have to be sure that you still implement all the security measures we discussed before. But you can focus on leveraging all the devices uh, and all the other gadgets on one device or multiple devices. Um, so, looking at FIDO, there are a lot of vendors who are offering hardware-based authenticators, uh, such as the fingerprint, but we see also a lot of new vendors popping up using software-based FIDO authenticators. Those are a little bit less secure because there's no hardware involved for storing secure elements, but it gives you pretty much a, a good way of uh, being flexible, that you don't have all the proprietary biometrics in the app itself, uh, and makes your return on investment on building the app much more uh, attractive. So I would like to hand over to uh, to Kopal. Uh, we will do an introduction, introduction uh, to the various offerings. Kopal, can you take over? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Uh, See, I think Dennis has clearly you know, laid out why biometrics is the solution for this password-free experience. Uh, so given that background, uh, I would like to quickly talk about the offering we have on the space, uh, which is a web authentication. Uh, as you can see on your slides, this is a solution that leverages an uh, end-user's mobile phone to provide uh, biometric authentication, uh, where uh, the you know, it will support multiple uh, modes of authentication, like it could be just a uh, simple push notification, or it could be, uh, you know, fingerprint or a facial, or it could be a voice uh, authentication as well. So if you look at uh, the diagram below, that explains the flow on how we will, uh, how we expect uh, it to happen. Uh, so you have a user uh, doing a transaction from his uh, internet browser, and he is set up for uh, mobile authentication. Uh, so he initiates a transaction. Let's say that you know he wants to transfer uh, a thousand rupees from one account to another. 
the system uh, the bank can configure that for those transactions that meet uh, a mobile biometric authentication okay so there in those cases a notification will be sent to uh, the EV auth server and then EV auth server will send a push notification to the user's uh, registered mobile device uh, and then the user will be expected to authenticate himself either by you know, just plainly accepting it if it is a plain push notification or by putting his fingerprint or putting his face uh, if it is a biometric requirement. So if you look at it, the transaction could initiate potentially from any channel but it comes and gets uh, the authorization actually happens on the mobile device and then the appropriate channel gets a message. So on this example, we have actually shown a user browser, but it could be a mobile banking app or it could even be a call center scenario where I've called somebody to update some details and uh, you know they're trying to authenticate myself. It could even be an ATM scenario where instead of entering PIN on the device, uh, uh, on the ATM device, I just authenticate myself using my fingerprint. Uh, so there was a question from Shivendra on uh, how to improve the OTP experience per se. So if you look at it, uh, there, uh, you know, the push notification that we provide is actually a better way of authenticating users uh, instead of OTP because a lot of uh, telecom companies have said that uh, they are not able to secure SMS communication. Uh, to the extent of allowing financial transactions. So, uh, but what we deliver is a push notification which is encrypted and the user can act on that. So, I, I hope that answers uh, that question from uh, Shivendra. I think there's one more question. I'm just going through the question. Biometric experience, how to improve the biometric experience in ATMs? I think we briefly referred to that. Uh, you know, instead of uh, asking the user to enter a PIN or something, we could have a notification being delivered on his mobile and him authenticating using the fingerprint. So that is one option that uh, we could look at. Uh, so having said product thus, I'll kind of quickly move towards the security aspects of the product. Uh, what you see there, you know, those little black guys are the guys trying to kind of uh, hack into the system or get data from the system and we have kind of tried to uh, put down how we handle those uh, attempts. So on the app, you could have people uh, trying to fiddle with the app settings uh, to actually break uh, the authentication or spoof some authentication. To prevent that, we have uh, jailbreak uh, detection on the device, we have tamp tamper detection, and all uh, the storage is encrypted and all the communication is encrypted as well. Uh, that leads to me the communication between the app and the APIs where somebody is trying to eavesdrop. So we have TLS and we have an optional payload encryption as well that can be used to secure uh, the communication that is happening. On top of it, we have uh, uh, the certificate pinning option where the app can be 100% sure that it is talking to the server it is supposed to talk to. Again, on the server side, we tokenize uh, the account numbers and user IDs. So it makes it difficult for somebody to break the whole thing. Uh, while we are on security, I think there was a question from Ankit on uh, how secure is a uh, fingerprint and uh, can it be spoofed? See, I think uh, there are videos on the internet which show that uh, it can be spoofed, uh, uh, but the thing is that what does it require to spoof it? Uh, you know, so basically you know it requires a lot of effort to actually spoof it and break it and if you look at the way this is set up uh, you have to have the device as well to break into that particular account and i think the second question from from ankit was that can it be used as a single factor authentication i would say the answer is it depends on the context you know if you are looking at a high value transaction or uh, if you are looking at a high-value transaction especially, I won't recommend using, I would never recommend using just a single factor authentication. You always uh, go for a second factor is what we would uh, recommend. Uh, so to answer that question, it de depends on the context. If it is just a login or, you know, just some kind of uh, read kind of access that we, have, we are providing, maybe a single factor would work. But for transactions, uh, we would always recommend it as a second factor 
of authentication. Uh, and there is one more question uh, on uh, the kind of integration that is required at the back end. Uh, see, actually the integration footprint of the device is very minimal. What we need for integration is uh, just a user ID that will reside on our system. Uh, having said that, we need uh, two more integrations there. One is on your mobile application, we would need to integrate uh, the SDKs uh, that have these uh, biometric capabilities. That is one. And then for the initial setup, we would need to integrate with the host server that will authenticate the user for the first time, telling that, hey, this is Gopal. Uh, this guy is claiming to be Gopal. The host system will say that, hey, this is Gopal, and you can allow him to uh, use the biometric authentication for Gopal. So that is the integration that is required, but you know the integration footprint is uh, minimal. Uh, and then we provide APIs for you to kind of call our system whenever authentication is required. And it is as simple as saying that, hey, authenticate Gopal using this method of authentication, and it will uh, give you the result. So the integration should be a very, uh, it should not be a complex effort at all. It should be a pretty simple effort. Uh, this is Sundra here. One of the most consistent questions we've been having with the audience is primarily maybe because uh, a lot of banks from India are participating is one of the questions is around Aadhaar. Aadhaar is again a government initiated program where uh, the fingerprints of every Indian citizen has been captured. So the question to both the panelists has been as to whether uh, how easy or difficult is it to leverage that particular uh, biometric capture for banks? Is that a feasible option? And what would your thoughts be? I will probably start with Gobal, and then Dennis can probably add on as well. Uh, see, thing is, the biometric authentication that we are providing are you know completely device based, and uh, for fingerprint we rely on the fingerprint scanner that is available on the device, uh, be it iOS or be it Android, and that is stored locally and it is verified locally as well. So if we have to integrate with the other system. You know, basically we could look at it uh, as, you know, if you remember Dennis's slides, you had, uh, you know, three different options. You know, you can use it for uh, authentication, you should use, you could use it for KYC as well and stuff like that. So from a KYC perspective, Aadhaar uh, would be useful because you can expect the customer to be there uh, at your place where you have the specialized hardware provided by or, you know, certified by Aadhaar to capture the fingerprint and verify against the database. But when you're trying to authenticate, especially on the mobile device, uh, you know, that is not something that is feasible yet unless we have kind of other enabled uh, fingerprint scanners on the mobile phone. I saw last week that uh, the Indian government is actually uh, kind of engaging with uh, mobile hardware providers to enable iris uh, scan feature that leverages other iris. If that becomes a reality, definitely we could uh, a kind of hook up with Aadhaar and you know validate that particular person. But unless that happens, uh, uh, I don't see Aadhaar being used for mobile uh, biometric authentication. Uh. Thank you, Gopal and uh, Dennis. Uh, just uh, another, uh, I have a few more questions, but uh, just a quick word. Uh, we actually have a demo in the subsequent section which would actually answer some of the questions being asked. And towards the end, uh, we would kind of come back to the questions around the implementation. A lot of you have also asked as to which of the banks have adopted this and what is the kind of learnings we've had from each of these. So I would just uh, push back and hold it for now. And uh, without further ado, I'll just run you through a couple of uh, quick sessions. Now that we have had a fairly interesting uh, section on how the whole industry is looking at this and what an actual solution does, uh, one thing which we probably would all like to see is actually see it real time as well as kind of get us a glimpse of how it's possible. So one of the first things we would like to show you is a quick video on fast onboarding. Uh, passwordless banking doesn't just mean enabling your current customer to come on board. It also means that you can get people who you never thought would visit your branch to also become your customers. And as a quick glimpse, we're going to play you this particular video which will uh, quickly give you a sense of how fast new customer onboarding can be with the new solution. Faster onboarding. We all hate to wait in a crowded line, which is why airlines and many other services provide priority boarding lines. Think about your bank offering this service. Onboard the customer in less than one minute by initiating the app, 
providing customer email address and other required information, identify customer by recording their biometric identity, creating PIN for customer. Onboarding is as simple as that. Okay, I, I know that we had about 10% or 12% who were a little skeptical as to how it works. So unless you see it real time, most of us even probably tend to believe as to what we see is what we do. So we're going to show you a few quick scenarios around uh, the login for online banking using biometric authentication. I would be showing a browser as well as a mobile, both of which are simulated and shown on my uh, um, uh, screen. Similarly, I would also show you a quick transaction around payment as well as how it's authorized biometrically. And we'll also show you a quick configuration about how it's done with respect to various settings within the application so that the bank doesn't have to do a lot. The user can configure as much as possible. And we'll also show you a quick uh, uh, application of the voice-based banking possibilities which we have. So uh, I'll do a quick screen share and then kind of run you through uh, what we have on in terms of our offerings. So as you can see, I have a mobile screen projected on my left-hand side and I have a browser on my right. The browser on my right is going to be my online banking login page and the one on the left is actually my mobile screen. I'm bringing it back into the main page. So if I were to say login to my uh, online banking screen with respect to mobile notification, I would just ask for a mobile push and I would be notified for the same on my mobile screen. I accept the same and I would be automatically logged in into my online banking screen which is on another device. So as you can see, you no longer need a username or a password uh, to just quickly log in and see how it's possible. And uh, let me again try. Now that we tried just a push notification, say let's, we want to be a little more secure. We want to maybe have a look at my face and want to make sure that it's really me before logging in. So it's again going to pop me up, ask me whether I want to be notified. I would say okay. It's now going to ask me and look at my face. It's identified me and it's logging me in again. So that's another quick way to log in without the use of passwords. And uh, as we discussed earlier, I'll now run you through the mobile user experience because most of our user experience has been through the online, which is the traditional way to bank. I'm now going to log in into the application. I've set the default identifier as my face, so I'll be looking at it. The first feature I'm going to talk to you is going to be on my uh, face blurring. As you can see, the screen is initially blurred. If I were to say move my face outside of the screen or maybe move it out, the screen is automatically blurred out. So what this shows is that the screen can be blurred out pretty simply and it's pretty secure no matter where you are. The next feature I'm going to show you is with respect to transactions. It's pretty convenient to just transfer, say I want to transfer $30 to Gopal or one of my friends here and see what happens. And it was maybe over for lunch. It's a fairly small number, but it still requires my authentication. So one of the advantages of this particular uh, solution is that you can set multiple level of authentications for different transactions. If it's a smaller value, it, a push notification is good enough. If you want it to be of a much higher value, you can always come back and change it. And the other interesting aspect of this particular solution is that uh, I have multiple options. You, normally when you think about banking online mobile, a lot of the configuration and security settings are set at the bank's back end and doesn't let the user do it. What we have enabled is actually let the user choose as to what are the kind of authentications required, what he would like. So what it does is that somebody who's old school and who doesn't like to actually use biometrics still has the option of using pins and you can still do password like the old style. And also you have the option of choosing whether you'd like to identify with your face, fingerprint or pin and tomorrow to be anything else as well. As the list goes on, the options are just endless. So that's like a quick preview on what we do. And uh, the next quick thing I'm going to show you is with respect to our voice banking capability. A lot of us know that voice banking is something which has been spoken about ever since we've been talking through it. but. Uh, 
over the years it's just kind of faded in and till recently it hasn't come up welcome to voice banking show account balance your account balance is $3500 show mini statement october 4 2016 transferred $125 to amit october 1 2016 Show pending bills. You have following bills: one hour out, two BSNL, three Amex. Which one do you want to pay? Adam. You have following bills: one hour out, two BSNL, three Amex. Which one do you want to pay? So in this situation, what happens is that we have the option to also key in what we want. So if I just type in one. I can always be show pending bills as a message and then not always speak. So if you're in a noisy situation where you don't want to actually ask each of these, you can just type in say Amex. And here you go, the bill is paid. Similarly, if it, you can always ask for a like coming back to the voice banking. If I'm say driving and I would like to kind of maybe look for a nearest ATM, I could just speak into it and ask for it. Welcome to voice banking. Nearest ATM? It actually pulls up Google Maps and tells me as to where the nearest ATM would be. So that's kind of how easy it is to use. So I would kind of just pause here and kind of come back to into our context. So given all of this and the various contexts of where we are, um uh, now that a lot of your questions might have been answered with the demo but uh, we still have a formal time for a q and a so uh, one thing i would have probably wanted to ask you all is how long do you think a biometric authentication would have taken given what you have seen what do you think and ask as the poll is going through i see that we have a lot of questions around uh, things like uh, as based on the demo one of the questions from rajendra has been around push notification so uh, the first question was in push notification is there any other identification or authentication that is happening so the way we wanted to showcase it was the ease of use so with respect to push notification we assume that the user is already on his default device and he doesn't need to do further authentication it doesn't need a multi factor authentication it's a single authentifier so if you are very sure and if it's a low level transaction push notification will work for you so that's one question uh, so rajendra just uh, one thing we need to remember is, is that uh, you know the device has to be registered against that user uh, uh before he receives a push notification and the registration process would be uh, through either a user id and password or it could be user id and otp or something like that so that is the way it works so we initially validate that hey, this is a valid device for the user and then from there on uh, we actually send a push notification to him and ask, ask him to accept it so if, if you think of it it is probably as secure as an otp transaction uh, again you know if you think of the otp flow initially there is a validation that it is your valid mobile and then uh, once you have the mobile with you you are able to complete the transaction so the same thing is happening here uh, through push notification with uh, better user experience and with additional encryption uh, some of the other interesting questions which we had was one is from Alistair who's asked us in terms of how do you prevent a person's picture to be uh, used instead of his recognition so if you notice in our demo there was one instance where i actually had to move my head towards a certain direction as notified on the screen so normally when you do that only an actual head would be able to kind of depict that and then move in the right direction and get that so that particular identifier is what kind of differentiated and ensures that there is no misuse of that particular biometric authentication similarly the next question we have is on the multilingual option and i assume that this would be with respect to our voice banking so voice banking typically is uh, based on the technology which is provided by multiple leaders that's such as nuance uh, microsoft google and many such of them who have who have been kind of doing this for many years so uh, no matter what region they support and how they have been working on this 
depending on the support we would i don't think language is going to be a constraint with respect to restricting it and uh, we should be able to support as much as possible provided we have strong validation as well as a strong uh, push from the market for this particular requirement and uh, the next question we had on uh, in terms of is in terms of how many devices because i know i have been showing multiple devices as it gopal just responded to this one yeah see as of now we uh, allow only one device to be registered uh, for a particular user because uh, yeah the more devices you allow probably less secure it becomes you lose the device and things like that so as of now we allow only one device per user to be registered for this authentication the other question we have is uh, from jen with his respect to the uh, biometrics being complementing the existing authentication yes because we understand that not everybody is going to be jumping to biometrics on day one the existing banking cannot be disrupted and people who prefer the old ways will still be able to do it so even in our scenarios say if one of my authentication had failed it would have immediately prompted me to enter my pin and based on my pin i would be able to go back and say that i will be able to use my pin and just notify it or maybe an otp combination depending on how i want to do it similarly uh, if a user does not want any biometrics he obviously has the option to just go back to an otp or a pin option where he doesn't prescribe for it and he's able to transact the way he normally used to so it's purely from the user convenience perspective as well as the bank's comfort level as to question on the background architecture use so gopal if you can take that that from one side on the server part we protect the apis uh where you have all kind of encryption and, and uh mechanisms that is based on all two protocols uh some of two open open id connect so it's very based on open standards because what you now see is that people would like to use open standards inst instead of proprietary protocols um on the mobile part there is the sdk where uh all the security uh mitigations are uh, are embedded and in between there's uh of course TLS and payload encryption etc so if you look at implementing it at your server side we have seen that it's complementary to the current infrastructure already at most of the enterprises so we connect the solution to your internal infrastructure and that's it so the impact is very low and it also the SDK can be added to your um existing app or it can be of course being implemented in a new app but also it can be added to an existing app i hope that answered the question because i think it can take some more time to dig into the 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 nitty-gritty details of the uh, technical solution of course thank you dennis dennis we have one yeah. more question uh, with respect to uh, uh the atm this is probably linked to the atm transaction uh do atms normally have a timeout and with respect to biometrics being integrated with atms how do you think the scenario would pan up what are your thoughts on that uh there are different ways how you can uh implement it i, I see now solutions that uh, options that from whenever in the atm itself that uh um that they are sending out a push notification on a mobile phone and then you can sign the transaction or get your money in a very simple way using a mobile phone so the atms become very very small in essence so ac atms where the biometrics is embedded as a hardware on the atm itself so i hope this answers your uh, your question yes dave this thank you and uh, the next question was in terms of uh, what's been our experience in africa with the product offering so uh, I I probably answered it from the Infosys Finical perspective. Infosys Finical has been present in the African market for a while. We have had multiple solutions and uh, some of our flagship banks include Bank Tech like Standard Bank as well as a few other ones which have uh, presence across the entire continent. So most recently we have actually been to multiple events across Egypt, South Africa to name a few countries and uh, we actually showcase these products there and uh, we've received interest starting from the central banks to all the way individual banks so in terms of the interest most of them are interested in terms of their implementation 
each of them have their own regional challenges. So with respect to Egypt, they mentioned that uh, not all devices are available across consumers. So they asked me, what if somebody has a phone without a fingerprint reader? Would he be able to bypass this or something else? So we are trying to work through each of these because with respect to each region, there would be certain hardware or usage pattern which would be different. So we are in talks with each of these banks to figure out what would be the best and most optimum mechanism to handle their queries. But uh, as a region, Africa is fairly mature around this and is kind of growing as we see because they, they are probably having a lot of issues around ATM snarfing as well as data breaches across the region. And uh, given that biometrics will make uh, their life easier, not just from the security perspective, but also in terms of winning back the customer credibility, uh, they are looking at this solution pretty seriously. So that's kind of our take on it. Well, if you look at from the security part and the infrastructure for push authentication, everything you see, uh, there are uh, customers in uh, in Europe, uh, especially uh, companies like ING, uh, some banks are using it over here, uh, telco operators such as Belcom, Transamerica, which, uh, Egon, which is a large insurance company, uh, CFT, which is a bank in, uh, in Morocco. So there are a number of banks already using the push technology to log in and also insurance companies. So there, we can share that uh, in a later stage. Um, yeah, that's it. We just have a poll on your yeah. screen, Pontus. So I'll keep the poll open for maybe another 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, it's a fairly diverse mix in terms of what we are seeing. So it's pretty interesting. And uh, we have a few questions, but uh, I'm not sure. We have a fairly short timeline. We have only four more minutes to answer all your questions. Uh, the questions which are not answered on the webinar today, we will answer it offline as well as it, we will reach out to you by emails as well as any further communication. Uh, I'll just quickly go to a couple of other questions which are kind of touching upon what we have. Uh, one question is from uh, Subramaniam. He's asking in terms of uh, voice banking, do we have any machine learning algorithm and how does it work? So uh, to kind of answer your question, I think uh, we normally tend to lean on industry experts in terms of speech recognition. So if that involves machine learning and how a person's voice stress would be on certain syllable, yes, the answer is a yes. But since it's an evolving field, we are looking at evolving along with industry, and we will stick to the industry best practices as the adoption happens. So in terms of that, we are pretty much on page. And the next question we have is, uh, with, is with respect to uh, implementation. So I think one question we've been having consistently all through has been on have how many banks have been implementing it, what's the scenario around it. I'll let Gopal kind of start on with it. And, and I think he's already touched upon this. But in terms of uh, any further details, uh, we will be able to respond to it post the webinar. If you have any detailed questions, please drop a note to us. We would be able to come back to you on that. Uh, one other question has been, an interesting question has been, What's the difference between this and Apple Pay? Like, how, how would the uh, approach be? And uh, the second question is, uh, where is the authentication server based? Is it based on the customer location? Is it on the uh, bank's location? Is it a cloud, publicly, private, shared? What would that be? So, Dennis, if you might, might want to start with that. Yeah. So, uh, basically, that's up to you as, a, as an enterprise, as a customer. Uh, so, that depends on the regulations. So, it's, it's very lightweight in a sense. It can be installed on-premise, uh, which is the preferred situation for most of the financials because of regulations, because they want to be in control. But at the same time, it's very easy to deploy it in your cloud, private cloud infrastructure. So uh, we, we decided to do, uh, set it up like this because of the controls and security measures. So it's in that sense, it's not a multi-user um, SaaS solution. We deliberately separate all the instances for to be compliant to all the regulations. But it can be in your private cloud, can be in your premise uh, solution. Be flexible in that. Um, uh, uh, so basically, I think Apple Pay, uh, the way it authenticates is basically it uh, uses Touch ID to authenticate your fingerprint. And we would be relying on the same Touch ID for uh, authentication as well, uh, as your question is from the authentication perspective. Uh, having said that, you know, this will work across devices, not just uh, uh, iPhone. It will work with Android, and it can be actually, uh, you know, used to authenticate any uh, any transaction from any channel, not just, uh, uh, you know, restricted to mobile. But to answer your question, yes, uh, it uh, basically it relies on the Touch ID uh, authentication mechanism. That way, uh, it relies on the Apple Pay's approach to authenticate the user. 
Uh, team, I think we are really running short of time. So before we kind of conclude, I want to quickly run you through the results of your poll. Uh, we had a question based on the demo as to what would be your bank's preferred mode of authentication. An overwhelming majority has said fingerprint. Uh, as a, maybe there's, there's a pretty slight competition between the eye-based recognition, uh, facial recognition, and mobile notification. And also, in some cases, my bank still doesn't prefer OTP or the traditional way of banking. So in one sense, if you look at how the audience has responded to it, uh, we'll have to say that uh, the opinions might vary. But what stands out is the fact that fingerprint and biometric authentication is here to stay and will be here for a while. Like it's something which was more of a concept, but it's now becoming more and more of a practice. And as we move forward, it will only mature and maybe we'll add in more methods. And uh, with that particular thought in mind, uh, we would probably conclude this particular uh, webinar here. We thank you all for coming and bringing your questions as well as kind of uh, letting us through the whole uh, presentation. Uh, we Our subject matter experts are still available. Uh, I know some of the questions were not answered on this particular call. We would be responding back to you in email or in person, so it shouldn't be a problem. But anyway, we thank you all for joining in. We want to thank Dennis and Gopal for taking time off their schedules and being a part of this session. And on behalf of Infosys Finical, Edgeworth, and Wanjini, I want to thank all of you for coming in as well as being a part of this. We look forward to seeing you all in our future sessions as well. Thanks once again for participating and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.